Hey everybody, happy early 4th of July. And we are going to do another session today, dun, 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 with Letty and Sione. And uh, we're gonna review a couple things real quick about cardiac. And then we're gonna dive into um, some study tools, some flashcard skills. And we're gonna be doing renal, am I right? Renal. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Y'all back me up here because you guys did it and I did not. They are the experts. Defer to them at the moment. <laughs> okay, so for one thing I wanted to mention, when you guys are doing your Hoffman and Sullivan readings, it's very helpful when you're reading through um, with the vascular disorders and everything. What you got to remember is each one is just a little bit different. And when you're looking through the Hoffman Sullivan book, it's really helpful because it's got pathophysiology, how it manifests, you know, medically how it's going down, things like that, different tests that you're going to run, different drugs that you're going to use, okay? And then um, what you're going to do about it, all right? What you're going to do as a nurse. So that kind of stuff's really helpful. So just make sure that when you're doing your drugs and, and doing your, your medication drugs, uh, one of the tips that I would give just real quick for that is uh, when I run across them, I kind of shove them in the sheet and I'm sort of documenting the Hoffman Sullivan notes of like, this drug mm -hmm. in this category does this. And it's very, mm -hmm. very basic, right? But then later I'm gonna go back in and fill it in with what I find from the Davis book, just so you guys know out there, cause it's kind mm -hmm. of a lot of drugs, uh, but we do have to know them and just pick the main drugs. And fortunately I gotta hand it to Hoffman. It looks like they're sticking with just the main important drugs that we need to know, like digoxin and, you know, Oh God, furosemide and like every other drug under this, you know, you know the list. Anyway, so go through <laughs> there. But the book breaks it down pretty simple. Simp I can't say these words today. Simply. So it's got a lot of simplicity to it. So it's like being bang, boom. And that's one thing that I know that Mikey had said last week too. And again, just to reiterate, look for the chronic, chronic conditions and notice uh, the difference between something that's chronic versus acute. And if you do have a chronic condition, and you know someone's got a chronic condition, how do you know if something is worse? What's gonna really stand out for that specific condition? So uh, that's just something to remember when going through cardiac. I'm still plowing through it. I'm slower than mud. Letty, do you wanna say something? Can you give us an example of some acute and chronic conditions? Oh, girl, please. <laughs> Y'all gonna make me think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, a, a chronic condition would be uh, COPD. <laughs> You're welcome. Now, acute, uh, that's actually a really good thing. I haven't, I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't had a chance to go through. I want to. I'm going to tell you, I really want to go through. Here's a chronic condition. Uh, peripheral artery, arterial disease. That's what they're calling it now. It's PAD. That's a progressive oh, okay. chronic condition. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So PAD is chronic for sure. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I believe basically all atherosclerotic things tend to be chronic, but don't quote me. I am only a student nurse. I don't know what I'm talking about. So if I say something stupid, you're probably up there. Be prepared. Um, we could also ask, a, um, sorry, um, sorry to interrupt. We could please. also ask no. each other questions. Yes. Um, and then even if we don't know it, it's okay. We can always just like look in the book and find it and say it. We can also no, do no. that. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, Sione. I'm sorry. I was like, oh, oh, okay. I jumped. I'm so sorry. I, read something. <laughs> I found one. I'm sorry. Hypertension is also chronic. Okay, guys, you know, I'm going to be real with you. Look at chapter 31. Coordinating care with patients with vascular disorders. It seems to have a lot of the chronic ones. Did you, know, did you guys notice that? Did you guys notice oh, that? Oh, um, I'm not sure if I read that. Yeah. <clears throat> Which chapter? chapter? You didn't. Chapter 30. 30 has uh, chronic? Chapter 31 has a lot of chronic disorders. Uh, hypertension is considered chronic, yes. And, um, do, 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 do. you know, I ran some across some stuff that was acute and now I don't even remember what it was. This is what happens when you've got traumatic brain injury. In one brain cell, out the other. So I, I read it, it's gone. I don't know, I'm gonna have to make a list to be honest with you. I but think I, one of them could be um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, I believe. I would like assume. BS. Yeah, I would assume. I think, and I, I honestly, I think the EKG strip stuff that, you know, like that kind of stuff would be more acute because we can fix a lot of that. So it'd be acute is something that's, you know, right now immediate and fixable versus chronic is something that you have to live with for a very long time. So MedSurge 1 is focusing on the chronic disorders and then the acute stuff's going to come in a little bit later. So um, 
But again, you can never study too much. Now, this mm -hmm. is something my mom gave me. God bless my mother. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> she's amazing. This is really, really helpful. Uh, blew my mind. Uh, it's called ECG Notes Second Edition Interpretation and Management Guide by Shirley A. Jones. It is waterproof. Don't we all love that? And reusable. Mm -hmm. So you can write on it with pen and you can use alcohol wipes to erase your pen marks or you can use sticky mm -hmm. notes. How cool is that? I've never had a book in my life that you could actually annotate on. For the record, I want to go over what it goes over very quickly. It goes over these, these little tabs down here. I'm going to read them to you guys. This is mm -hmm. going to actually, I would suggest investing in this because I'm going to tell you why. It goes into stuff we need to know for peds. And mm -hmm. I know that's the semester, but that's helpful. So it gives you the basics. Then it goes into ECGs and different types, 12 lead meds. And when it does the meds, guys, it's really great. Here's a sneak peek. Look, look at this. Mm -hmm. You guys see that okay clearly? Because I can't tell. Mm -hmm. yeah, like, I, I it's you like, okay, here it is. Here's its class <laughs> indications, adult dose, pediatric dose, contra. Um, hello, doesn't that sound like what we need to know? Like, I'll just summarize mm -hmm. like, a tiny little sheet. I couldn't believe this. I was like, holy crap. Then there's skills. So skills we need to know. Uh, so like emergency medical skills, things like that. CPR tips. So some stuff, you know, in here that we need to know, some stuff we already do know, whatever. ACLS, okay. So like how to handle different things, like say ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Uh, and it also goes into PALS. PALS apparently is for pediatrics. I had to ask my mother because I was like, what is this? I do not know. But you get your ACLS and your PALS um, apparently before we finish uh, our AA. And this oh, book. Oh, really? Yes. So we have two more, two more certifications we have to get. And this book goes over that. It never hurts to have it. It also has rulers on the back. <clears throat> yeah, uh, we get our, sorry to interrupt, we get our EKG and ABG certifications. Yes. Oh, that's the other thing. That's we're going to be getting those this semester, and then before we're done getting our oh. license, you also have to get the ACLS and the PALS. So those are two other ones. That's later. But you know, if you're going to make an investment mm -hmm. in something, at least, at least it's there. Yeah. And here's the ISBN for those who want it. Uh, the ISBN ten is zero dash eight zero three six dash two one four two dash six the isbn 13 is nine seven eight dash zero dash eight zero three six dash two one four two dash eight so that should um and i'll i'll see if i can put that there for a second can you guys see that clearly like because so if people hit pause we can find it through Googling it. Okay. Yeah, you yeah. guys are better at Google. I forget that there's even a thing called a YouTube, so it's kind of sad. I'm like, wait, I could totally YouTube this. Um, it's really, <laughs> it's it's really, posted what? under our video what the ISBN for the book is. Oh, that's brilliant. Why didn't I think of that? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Where would I be without you guys? But um, <laughs> yeah, it does go through some cool stuff. It ties in with what Letty's about to show you that she made for herself. Honestly, I would suggest making your own, but just to give you a tip, it does give you these and it does give you some summaries if you are looking for it already pre-made. But I'm gonna hand it off to Letty now because Letty's done some really <laughs> awesome stuff and um, has some great tips and advice. Uh, and if anybody has any questions for me about this, then you all can ask me as we go, but go ahead, Letty, take it away. Okay, so basically I was like, you know, we got to know all these rhythms and, you know, how am I, how am I supposed to know all this going into the hospital and look at a rhythm and be like, oh, I know what that is. Mm -hmm. So I actually caught, I went into our Hoffman book, the ebook, and I copied and pasted the rhythms from that book. I also copied and pasted the rhythms from the ECG made easy book that I told you guys about earlier in our other video. And I also went on to a website that had um, the same website, actually, that I sh showed you the EKGs on. Yeah. I copied and pasted those all into a Word document. And I print them all, printed them all out. And I laminated them. And I put the EKG characteristics on the back. <laughs> so this is 
how I didn't. Look at this amazing art stuff. It's so I know. Cool. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so here, I tried to cut them all to like the same length. And Look stuff. at that. That's amazing. And then on the back, right here, I have the. Yeah. I wrote the characteristics for this, you know, like mm -hmm. it, what's the rhythm, what's the rate, are there P waves, the PR interval, and then the QRS. And just yeah. to tag on with what Letty's saying, even if you guys, any of you guys out there do go and get this book, I would suggest doing something of your own flashcards, however you want to, the way that Letty is telling you to do it. Because it's one thing to read it, and it is another thing to write it and study it with your own hands. So making it with your own mm -hmm. hands is a whole new learning experience. So by all means, um, go ahead and take that extra step and follow through with what Letty's doing as well. Okay, Letty, keep going. I just wanted to tag that in there, sorry. No, it's okay. Thank you. Yeah. So then I was talking to Mikey and I was asking him about the EKG rhythms. And um, I, t I told him the ones that Ms. Snyder wanted it said for us to know. And he said, we don't have to know the junctional rhythms yet. Okay. But we will be doing, you know, like he said, EKG rhythms throughout med search. So I think we're going to be doing more EKG rhythms for med okay. search two and maybe three. Dun, dun, dun. But I'm not sure how much more there is. Um, but he said add supraventricular tachycardia into that list. And then he said we don't have to know junctional, but I, I'm gonna keep junctional in there anyways, because we're gonna spend that anyways. Absolutely. And he said no, no, the nursing interventions know the medications and then he also said that like if there's a question you have to like assess the patient you know look for the signs and symptoms yeah and a lot of the signs and symptoms for these rhythms are pretty much the same only some of them are a little bit different so you know i guess i would know what the signs and symptoms would be like the most common ones exactly um and then, so what I did for mine on this one, I did nursing interventions and medications. I feel like this would be a little bit more important to know. So I did it like this. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. and then right here, I put the name of the rhythm and then I attached a, an example of that rhythm. And then on the back mm -hmm. for this one, I have nursing interventions, the asymptomatic and symptomatic uh, ones that there are like go. in the book and then I have the medications for, for which for this one it just mentioned mm -hmm. the anticholinergic medications that's a smart and, way to do it and then so here I have my anticholinergic card right here I have its action the way it's in the book because if you look at the action in your drugs like uh, book it's going to tell you what it's actual action is but in the in the Hoffman book it tells you what it does for that EKG rhythm or like your heart and stuff so hey, this is what it does I have to some special precautions and then on the back I went into the drug book and mm -hmm. I found the adverse reactions and side effects and stuff and their nursing assessments so like let me show you another one uh, so this one had three three or four medications this is the for the beta blockers so i put the severe ones in red and the regular ones in black and then the nursing like assessment here mm -hmm. and okay. yeah so i just kind of you know whole bunch of them put them on the ring and stuff but you know, these are great because, I mean, it's not just an excuse to use my laminator, but it kind of is, but <laughs> I also wanted it, like, laminated because when we go to the hospital, you know, I can just wipe them down with something and they're good to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys, we have a mild problem. What's up? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt. It's it's giving us a time frame this rodeo, which really stinks. So it's like, oh, I know. Oh, I that's why I was like, oh, I'm really sorry. I want to warn you now. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna have to do. Oh, 
Lord, why? Okay. Um, yeah. So we've got eight minutes and then we just, we'll just have to, are you guys fine with restarting it and then doing, we'll just upload mm -hmm. two and then we'll yeah. just uh, let everybody know that there's one in the bottom that they can go view. We'll just have to do two sessions this time. I'm so sorry. Go ahead and finish oh. everything else you want to say, but if it cuts out, I will um, reboot so you guys can get in. Okay. 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 All right. I just wanted to let you guys know. All right. Sorry. So we got seven minutes, 44 seconds, but take your time. Go ahead and finish up whatever you want to discuss. And then, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So after I got done talking to Mikey, I actually went back and made a different set of flashcards. <laughs> oh, very cool. <laughs> so I haven't made them yet, but this <laughs> is what they look like when I print them out. Mm -hmm. So if you guys want to make like your own flashcards and stuff. What I do is I go into Word and I put the narrow, like layout the borders so you can put more on your page. Okay. And then I go into table and I add like a two by two table. Okay. And then I go into like, you know, where, I don't know what to call it, but basically it's, how you can customize your table you can add more rows you can add more columns kind yes. of things. Yes. And so what i do is i increase the size of the tables until they're you know the same like for this one it's actually going to be 4.9 inches by 3.75 inches mm -hmm. so and then i just cut them out i put them you know one behind the other i put in the laminating machine I don't cut it directly on the line. So you can see right here, I kind of left a little bit of a border and that's because they're not glued onto each other. If you don't glue them onto each other before putting them in the laminating machine, they will come apart. Mm -hmm. And like, that's if you cut them right on the border. <laughs> and then, so for this one, I did it. I did this one on all the rhythms. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So it includes everything, even the stuff we don't need to know for this semester. And basically oh, okay. it has the rhythm, it has characteristics, signs and symptoms, the nursing interventions, the medications, like the ones that I showed you. And then at the end, yes. I also included a heart block poem and defibrillation versus cardioversion. Oh, I like it. Do you want to share that or no? Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm prepared. Yeah, you know, you should get creative about it. Yes. Like, make a song out of it. Right. I love yeah. mnemonics. I have a few dorky, really dorky mnemonics for remembering supraventricular tachycardia, but <laughs> I'll spare you for now. <laughs> what are your threat, buddy? What do you got? What's I'm going to show story? you real quick what these would look like. So right here, I have the little heart block poem. I have the example of each of the rhythms and then, you know, the little thing. So this one, I actually got off uh, Pinterest. Okay. On Pinterest, I, there's like a lot of stuff that you can find in there that's like super useful. I have my own little like med surge, like, what do you call it, in board. I have a nursing 101 board. I have a pharmacology board. Like there's a lot of stuff in there. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So like for the first degree one, it says if the R is far from the P, then you have a first degree. So basically what that's saying is there's a prolonged PR interval. Okay. Mm -hmm. There we go. I love it. And then <laughs> you have... Uh, longer, longer, longer drop, then you have a Weckenbach, Wenkebach. So Wenkebach is actually a second degree type one uh, mm -hmm. AV block. And then mm -hmm. that one, basically what's happening in that rhythm is that you have your PR interval here, and then the second one gets longer, the third one gets a lot longer until you have no PR interval, no PR as like the beat just drops. So there's nothing and then it picks up again mm -hmm. it starts short again gets longer then longer then longer and then it drops again okay. so that would be your first degree type 1 AV block and then you have your type 2 which is if some P's don't get through then you have Mobit 2 and that one it's like your um 
I don't know how to explain this one. <laughs> that's okay. That, that's okay. <laughs> and and then Dr. the Susan third degree okay. one is if P's and Q's don't agree, then you have third degree. So I remember this one. This one is basically like your P's, I believe, um, they're all like equally separate from each other. And so are the QRSs, yes. except there is no relationship uh, with the P's and the QRSs. So they will be like totally offbeat from each other. Oh, really? Yes. That's wild. Ooh. Let me see if I can find an example in here. We have two minutes and 30 seconds just to warn you. Very cool. So oh, you see how like there's all those P's and you have like random QRS's. Oh, but none cool. of them line up with each other. But they're even yeah. from each other. Oh, that's so weird. I know. That's really weird. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly go over cardioversion and defibrillation. So basically with cardioversion, that one, if I remember, um, the, like, I forget what it was, but something about the R wave, like it has to be lined up with the R wave. Um, mm -hmm. And that one. Okay, like, you know, Letty, hold that thought. I'm going to stop this so we don't lose the stuff, and then we'll start it with cardioversion. Does that sound good? Sound good. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, let me stop the recording because it's going to die right now, and I will see you guys in about one minute, okay? I'm okay. So, okay. so sorry. All right. We're gonna have to figure out how to upgrade this thing. All right, I'll see you in a second. Okay, sorry everybody, we had to cut the session in half this time, but if you wanna see what we were talking about before, go ahead and refer to the bottom links where it talks about study session group stuff and you can go look up the first part of today's stuff. And now Letty's gonna continue with talking about cardioversion. Take it away. Okay, so like I was saying, I need these little you know, flashcard kind of templates. So right here I have this side, you know, cardioversion and then defib. So basically with defibrillation, it says that um, we like have this discharge of energy anywhere in the cardiac cycle, but cardioversion is specific to the R wave. And with defib, that one, you're going to uh, you can use on someone without a pulse. And then from cardioversion, what it looks like is you would do that with a pulse. So like supraventricular tachycardia, atrial uh, fibrillation with rapid uh, ventricular, um, I forget, <laughs> RVR basically, and then atrial flutter and then ventricular tachycardia, um, like a pulse, and then defib would be for ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation without a pulse on both of them. And then it tells you um, in the book, in the Hoffman book, like where where you would place the pads. So for cardioversion, you would place them on the front and on the back. Okay. With defib, mm -hmm. you would only place them on the front, but uh, anterior and posterior placement have been approved. And then it goes into the energy, which is going to be basically like how many joules you're going to zap your patient with. <laughs> Are you going to give them the slow crank? You're going to just zap them. Yes. <laughs> so it looks like 200 joules might be like the max. Yes. And for a cardioversion, you actually start like around 50 for some of these. Some of them you start at like 120 and then you work your way up to 200. For defibrillation, you start at 200. I mean, you're trying to get that person to come back to life. You're going to go all the way, okay? So. Yeah. <laughs> well, big all right. So those were the two uh, differences between cardioversion and defib in the Hoffman book. I'm pretty sure we're going to be learning a little bit more about it in detail once we get to actual net search. So. Probably. There's always so much more that we end up learning when we finally get there. That's just, you know, a, a nice big surprise. So <laughs> only so much we can do in advance, right? Yeah. But that's okay. We'll be prepared at least. That was really helpful. Thank you for explaining that. Thank you so much. Was there anything else that you wanted to show right now? Are you ready for Siona to take the floor? 
Uh, I'm going to hand over the floor to Sione and she can talk about okay. the stuff she wants to talk about. All right, Sione in the house. What do you have to tell <laughs> me today? <laughs> Okay, so um, I uh, I learned about well something that I um, I saw that was mentioned in the message book um, often was the fact that um, so with diagnostic tests for different kidney disorders um, like um, hold on sure. Um, Okay, hold on. So I found that Okay. Um so this is something that was mentioned a lot in the message book. It says um the dye, the contrast, which is the contrast media that is used in diagnostic tests. Yeah. to visualize internal organs. Um, so we used an IV urography, for example, um, may be nephrotoxic, th uh, therefore encourage increased fluids unless contraindicated and monitor urinary output. It is essential that pre-procedure blood urea, nitrogen, and creatinine levels are assessed on any client undergoing a procedure where dye might be injected. And um, the PHCP may institute precautionary measures to prevent acute kidney injury or use small amounts of the dye. Yeah, so you have to be careful when administering the dye because sometimes it can be contraindicated since it is nephrotoxic. Yeah. Um, and then also, um, it did mention in both the Saunders book and the message book about potentially nephrotoxic substances oh. specifically yeah like um the med so specifically medications so there's actually a huge list um so some include um there are actually some um, antibiotics on this list so for antibiotics there's amphotericin b methicillin and um rifampin Tetra, uh, tetracycline, vancomycin, and um, okay, and then I also learned about, um, I'm just looking to see. Um, That's fine. Can I ask you a like, question? What yeah. is mm -hmm. Saunders book? I don't know if I have that. Oh, yeah. Um, it's this one. Yeah. I'll show you. I showed you this before. Oh, it's that thing? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Here you go, yeah. Jack. Remember this? <laughs> you can have that. I don't have that book yet. This is awful. Everybody's got it but me. I'm sorry. Um, What's this? So actually, book? I was on eBay and I saw it for really cheap, like for under 10 bucks. I'm about ready to bust out a Weird Al Yankovic what I bought on eBay song. So like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, eBay is really cheap. That's, <laughs> this that's one good. I actually got for, I think, like 50 or 60 bucks. Yo. Okay. The, the edition the before part. this, for a while, sorry, Sione. Um, oh, okay. The older edition for this one was like 30 something dollars, but they raised it up to the same price as this one. Oh. So I went ahead and got this one. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. they're gonna make it the same price. You might as well go for the gusto. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but Thank you so much for helping me out because I was like, uh, guys, I don't, I don't know which book that is. I'm like, um, we got like 80 books over there. <laughs> which book am I looking at here? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, so okay, um, for I learned about chronic kidney disease and for epidemiology. It's higher for individuals that are above 60 years old and for race. Rates are higher in African Americans and Native Americans, and it's also higher in men than in women. And um, for chronic kidney disease, the most common causes are diabetes and hypertension. Other risk factors include hyperlipidemia, smoking, the use of recreational drugs and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, 
Mm. And I believe Advil follows, falls under that category of yes. non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Yes. And also another, um, other risk factors are obesity, glomerulonephritis, and um, lupus can also lead to chronic kidney disease mm. and atherosclerosis, which is when um, there's plaque buildup in your arteries and also when your arteries become stiff. Yes, they can yeah. be calcified, which is very interesting. There's a few different varieties of it, which is, I didn't know that until I started digging around in there the other day. So yes, mm -hmm. very true. And that's actually, yeah. you know what's funny is the stuff that you're bringing up, I think it's actually in the atheros, I cannot ever say that word. You know what I'm trying to say. Atherosclerosis. Thank you, please. <laughs> please be my mouthpiece, because someone needs to do it. But um, mm -hmm. it, it must have come up in there, because what you're talking about I totally remember reading, and I think it came up when they were talking about angiography and magnetic resonance, mm -hmm. angiography, and things like that. So it's super helpful, and it's so neat to see how it all ties together like that. Um, and, mm -hmm. and it did have to do with the atherosclerosis and, and all those different um, artery diseases because of that heart mm -hmm. stuff like that, creating problems for the actual kidneys at that. Um, I'd have to look, but it's at that arterial level, I think. Am I wrong? Isn't that where it is? It's like right there, like that, that transition in the yeah. kidneys. It's like it starts to get hardened and clogged up and jacked up and it messes up kidney mm -hmm. function. Is that what you got on your end? Um, for atherosclerosis? Or just in general for kidney function. Because I know that that was, oh. it was coming up in the chapter uh, for vascular disorders. I'm like, hey, what do you know? It kind of ties together. Um, and oh. so it said that it was it, it could actually lead to kidney problems. Uh, I ended up oh. somewhere, but I'll oh. spare you me digging oh, okay. my hours. So that's interesting. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll dig while you talk. Mm -hmm. We can find it. Does atherosclerosis only happen like in the heart or does it happen no. in other parts of the body? It happens in all parts of the body. Mm. Yeah, um, it, it's an artery. Um, and then pulmonary edema is also another one for chronic kidney disease. And um, there will be GI symptoms like oh, nausea, really? vomiting, and headache, fatigue, confusion, altered calcium, and phosphorus levels. And um, so also decreased acid clearance and bicarbonate production results in metabolic acid. I think, we just, I, I think we lost Sione. She may have had a bit of a connection problem. Yeah, that's a, are you still with me? You can still hear me, right? It's not on my end. Oh, there yeah. she is. Yay! <laughs> I see her reconnecting right now. That was so weird. Um, Siona, can you hear me? Hello. Oh, good. I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Hello, hello, hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can hear you, Siona. Can you hear me? I see you. Um... I don't see her audio. Her video is not connected yet. Oh, she might have to reconnect. Um, if you want, okay. Letty, while we're waiting, if there's something that you want to just add while we're waiting, go right ahead. No, oh, I think she's coming back. Is she is she. Oh, there! Yay, Sione, are you back? Can you hear us? My internet is uh, it's not functioning properly. That's okay. That's okay. We'll wait. We can wait a second. It's no problem. I'm still sitting here trying to find that thing I was talking about because, oh, it might have to do with hypertension. Uh, kidney function. All right. Let me see. It might have to do with this. Here we go. Oh, here it is. All right. So this is about hypertension. You can find it on page 628 and it's in coordinating care for patients with vascular disorders. Um, hypertension, which this, this all falls under the same old big old mess, and hypertension is chronic, by the way. It uh, compromises kidney function. Its principal site of damage is the arterioles leading to the renal system. The continual high pressures exerting force against the walls cause them to thicken, which narrows the lumen. 
The blood supply to the kidneys is gradually reduced. In response to the reduction in blood supply, the kidneys secrete more renin, which elevates the blood pressure even more, complicating the problem. Eventually, the reduced blood flow may lead to the death of the kidney cells. So forgive me, it wasn't atherosclerosis specifically. It was actually hypertension, high blood pressure that can lead to that. Uh those oh, yeah. kidney things that I was reading about. I was like, boy, this is ringing a bell. I'm like, come on, where, where did I read this? Okay. <laughs> How's your internet? Are you, are you now? <laughs> oh yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah, okay, perfect. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's what I was reading about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you pu you got paused in this really great like surfer pose oh. for a while there. It looked like oh. like, like we're all partying like at the beach, but it was it was. <laughs> <nice>. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Um, the kidneys are responsible for conserving or getting rid of bicarbonate, so um, that can lead to issues with acid-base imbalance because bicarbonate is um it makes your blood more alkaline. So, um, so it, yeah, that could affect the acid balance. And then um, also, do you know why um, people with chronic kidney disease can also have anemia? Um, is it because um, the membrane or something like that? Like, I know that it filters, uh, like it has selective uh, permeability and I think that when there is damage it actually allows for uh, larger particles like uh, blood and plasma um, stuff to go through right okay that's a really good answer um, but the one in the book it actually says decreased production of erythropoietin oh, results in chronic okay. anemia yeah, because um, so oh, really? if you remember from anatomy and physiology, erythropoietin is a type of hormone that is released by the kidneys to create new red blood cells. So, so that's why we need, uh, it causes anemia. And for diagnosis, um, CT scans are used as well as renal ultrasound. And also urinalysis can be used because um, if uh, someone with chronic, uh, somebody that has chronic disease will have red blood cells, white blood cells, and also proteins. And oh, okay. yeah. Um, and then for treatment for chronic kidney disease, it will be, um, okay, so, well, actually, okay, so it's um, specifically uh, for hyperkalemia because people with chronic kidney disease tend to have hyperkalemia okay. um, just because since the kidneys aren't functioning properly, they can't get rid of the excess potassium. Um, so sodium potassium pump, right? It has to do with the sodium and potassium pump being damaged. Is that what it is? Going back to an um, I, I'm not sure. Um, okay. I just, um, I also, yeah, with sodium, the kidneys have a tr have trouble with filtering that as well. Okay. So when, yeah, when somebody has chronic kidney disease, and um, so for, to treat the hyperkalemia specifically, um, so it says that potassium can be cleared via dialysis. And okay. then also, um, a, um, so the patient can receive IV calcium gluconate which can help with hyperkalemia as well. And, um, and then it says that, um, okay, so um, that is to treat hyper, uh, hyperkalemia and then also uh, to treat the hypertension associated with having chronic kidney disease, there are certain medications. So do you know what kinds of medications that would be used to treat the hypertension? 
there's, although I don't know the name of them, but I know that there are some medications that will allow you to pull the water out via stool. And I thought that was the most fascinating oh, yeah. thing I'd ever read because I didn't know that was even a thing. And I was like, oh, yeah. wow, there's a way around it. Now, Letty, I saw you wanted to chime in. What do you want to say? Do you know the um, exact name? Because that'd be amazing because I don't remember the name of it. <laughs> I don't know the name of that medication you were referring to, but... um. I was gonna say stuff like anti, uh, you know, antihypertensives, like the prills and stuff like that. Yeah, which is also known as ACE inhibitor. So okay. anything that ends in ACE, um, that ends in, in pril is an ACE inhibitor. Got it. So, um, and then um, diuretics can also help with the hypertension. Um, because low blood volume, it causes the low, it causes low volume, which leads to low blood pressure, and um, also, um, okay, it says that, okay, so the medication that you were thinking about, Jack, is KL, KL8, which is um, used to treat um, elevated potassium levels it binds with potassium in the in the GI tract and excretes it through the stool oh that's amazing when I when I first mm -hmm. heard, I think we learned that from Professor Schneider or somewhere and I when I first heard that I was like yeah gosh I had no idea there was another way around this I thought you were just screwed like when you <laughs> heard, like dialysis or nothing and I'm like we have another option this is amazing I think there's even a drug correct me if I'm wrong mm -hmm that can actually increase you to, I hate to say this, but sweat it out. You know what I'm saying? More or less. Am I oh. right about that? Is that another one that's in there? There was some, another excretory way that way, like sweating it out was another way. Or, or maybe it helped mm. you know, through the pores, the large intestinal tract. It's probably like the least mm -hmm. used thing on the face of the earth, to be honest. Like who wants to sweat? Mm. <laughs> who wants to sweat that much? Yeah. I as much. <laughs> I got to replace all the sodium and everything else after that. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, there was something somewhere. Don't ask me. I lost that brain cell too, but you know, it floated through and passed out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and okay, so uh, also I'm just looking to see anything interesting, that, anything yeah. else interesting that I learned. Um, okay. Thank you so much. And which chapter was this again, Sione? Oh, you're welcome. Uh, this is... Um, it's chapter, chapter 62. 62. 62. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's super helpful. Okay. I find it's um, so fast. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. It's okay. um, so also, um, another problem that people have when they have, have um, chronic kidney disease is something called dyslipidemia, which I'm not really sure what that is. I'm going to just look it up really quick. Uh, so dyslipidemia. Uh, dyslipidemia, an inherited acute metabolic disorder that involves the creation and degradation of lipids. Oh, dyslipidemia. Dyslipidemia is an abnormal amount of lipids in the blood. Okay, so to oh. treat that, um, oh yeah. Oh no, I was just, um, oh okay, so, that was, sorry. Okay, it's okay. Um, so to treat that, statins are used to lower the LDL cholesterol level. And there's also something else called fibrate. And those are, it says it is the most effective medication for lowering triglyceride levels. So fibrate, and then, um, and they can also be used to increase the HDL level. And um, so, and I just want to talk to talk about renal cancer. Um, so actually something, this was surprising to me, so renal cancer is actually not responsive to, towards chemotherapy, so um, really? yeah, they, they can't, oh what? I did not know that, that's crazy. 
Yeah, so they, yeah, um, they won't get chemotherapy because it won't treat the cancer. So instead, they, it's treated through, um, let's see, uh, it is treated through, <laughs> okay, so it says here the medications that are used are, um, it's called cytokine, interleukin-2, or oh, wow. interferon, and uh, yeah, it's helped to, um, it, it helps to boost the immune system and destruct, and aids in the destruction of the cancer, cancer cells. So again, that's cytokine, interleukin-2, and interferon. So... Yeah, and then, um, so both, both contain inter as the prefix, so you can oh, thank you. remember it, memorize it that way. I love, yeah. I love mnemonics, and, love them, thank you. Yeah. They saved my life. And then, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. so, Um, and I, let me see what else I learned. Oh, that's a cute little one. Oh, okay, this is pretty interesting. So this is part of evidence-based practice. It's called the Association of Urinary Tract Infections and Neuropsychiatric Disorders, including delirium in the elderly. So UTS can actually lead to delirium in the elderly population. Yes. And actually, also, um, so cranberry juice can help to treat UTS, and also vitamin C may also inhibit the growth of bacteria by acidifying the urine. And um, yeah, and then so with the association of urinary tract infections and neuropsychiatric disorders, including delirium in the elderly, it says UTIs um, can lead to delirium and, is pre um, and delirium is prevalent in up to 30% of the elderly population in the United States. So delirium and dementia get confused. So Dementia is um, something that is chronic, but delirium is something that's acute. Um, so, and then evidence-based nursing recommendations. Um, okay, so it says, assess for common symptoms of UTI, this, which is dysuria, which also, um, I believe that's difficulty with urination, urgency and frequency when delirium is present. And then it says, confirm laboratory results before administering antibiotics for somebody with a UTI, and then uh, consider the presence of comorbidities like Alzheimer's um, or dementia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, uh, do, you, do any of you know what kinds of medications we use to treat UTIs? Yeah, there's a there's a whole host. Um, I mean, just about, oh gosh. Well, I know you can use um, Bactrim, sulfa drugs. You can use, although those can cause a lot of allergies on okay. you know, certain people, like, uh, you know, depending. Uh, oh, goodness. Um, is it Keflex as well? Isn't that used or no? Is it not listed there? Um, so, Keflex, um, I don't see that um oh yes i do okay. yeah keflex yeah bactrim too yeah uh, azithromycin right maybe azithromycin yeah amoxicillin i knew it was one of those cillin things okay so azithromycin mm -hmm. i think as well but i could be wrong okay i'm not sure about that i'm not um, sure but yeah amoxicillin do you remember that one yeah cipro is another one which one's oh, um, Cipro? That's right. Oh my gosh, how could I forget Cipro? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, and um, have any of you heard of pyelonephritis? 
pyelonephritis. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard of nephritis. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, no, so I'm gonna go ahead and let you tell okay. what it is. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll start with the uh, the epidemiology. So um, young women are most often affected, and it says probably reflecting sexual activity in that age group. So an associated increased susceptibility to UTIs. So that's interesting. It's um you could potentially get pyelonephritis from sexual activity. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I didn't think that was, yeah, um, a, something that you could get from having sex. And then it says, uh, okay, so these infections may be caused by, oh, the major risk factor associated with pyelonephritis is multiple pre-existing UTIs. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and then, the pathophysiology of pyelonephritis is that it is okay. So pyelonephritis is an um, is an, is an inflammatory disease of the renal parenchyma. So mm. parenchyma. Um, I'm not sure. I'm gonna see what parenchyma is. Sure. I'm not sure. I have or a picture. I think yep. somewhere around here. Okay. Uh, don't or, kill me. We have eight minutes and 56 seconds. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh. oh, we're going to have to do something. I, I, will, I will have this rectified by next week. So the parenchyma is basically the inner tissue which contains all of the functional layers. So oh. I think it's going to be like this stuff like right here. Let me break out my glasses. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's like all the outer oh, stuff. Right? Or is, it, is it outer or inner? Like inner stuff. It, has, it says it's the inner inner, inner tissue yeah. that contains all of the functional layers. That makes sense. I'm guessing oh. these are all the functional layers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um. So... It says, yeah, the pyelonephritis is an inflammation of the renal parenchyma. And, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I see it. Um, so, and then it says, and the urinary collecting system. So, so also known as the bladder. Um, and then the most common cause is a bacterial infection that occurs as a result of contamination of the urinary meatus. Mm. And um, the, uh, the bacterium E. coli is the most common cause. So that oh. would be important to know. Uh. And then clinical manifestations of pyelonephritis are signs of infection, which include fever, chills, nausea and vomiting, back pain. And um, it says that... There also there will also be hematuria, which is blood in the urine, mm. and then um, dysuria, urinary urgency or incontinence, and diagnosis would be through a urinalysis, which can show pyuria, which is white blood cells in the urine, and bacteriuria, and um, Treatment of pyelonephritis is through, um, okay, so specifically medications that are used um, include Bactrim and um, fluoroquinolones. Oh, yes, that's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. and um, it says caution should be used when, uh, when antibiotics such as um, trimethoprim Sulfa, metho, methoxazole, and the fluoroquinolones are used because these antibiotics are contraindicated in children and childbearing women as a result of the teratogenic effect on bone growth. So, fluoroquinolones and trimethoprim, sulfa, methoxazole should not be used in childbearing women and children. And teratogenic um, when, when it says teratogenic effect, it, um, is, it's actually um, referring to something, I believe teratogen means something that's 
Yes, it, it can um, cause a lot of different problems. It can cause birth defects, cancer causing agents, uh, toxic to uh -huh. the birth defects. Uh, yeah, teratogenic. Yeah, um, um, yeah teratogenic is uh, developmental malformation. Yeah, no. and actually also um, you should know for maternity and uh, for that course, so you should know the like certain teratogenic um, medications yeah. and like substances. Yeah, that, that would be important to know for that course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then um, One second. Um, have any of you, and then I'm just going to um, talk about one last disorder that um, I don't think a lot of people know. So there's polycystic kidney disease. Have you ever heard of that? I heard about it, uh, but I, I didn't get to look at it too much, but I thought that was really interesting because I did not know it existed either at all whatsoever. Mm. Okay, so it's, um, it's fluid-filled cysts in the kidneys. Ooh. Yeah, and um, hold on one second, because um, I remember we learned about it in in, um, in AMP, and there was something that caused it that we talked about. It was something like, um, hold on, okay, so. Okay, so I think this was it that we were talking about. Um, and it says here, like, um, it, it says artificial sweetener, especially aspartame, produces a large amount of methanol. And then the methanol in aspartame converts to formaldehyde, which is especially harmful for people with PKD. Are you kidding me? You mean yeah. somebody like dying yeah. right now was causing me issues? I'm, stuck drinking oh. <laughs> I'm looking at it, I'm like, um, how dare yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. um, so, and then for polycystic kidney disease, it says that it is caused by an autosomal recessive disorder and it leads to severe lung and liver dysfunction and end stage renal disease. And, um, Pathophysiology would be that it is a genetic genetic disorder that manifests in the cortex and medulla of the kidneys, and um, it cause um, it leads to the development of fluid filled cysts. And <clears throat> oh, and I'll, okay, so the compression of the underlying tissue due to the cysts, cysts reduces the blood flow and subsequent nutrient supply to the renal tissues. And... Um, Fiona, forgive me, it says less than a minute. Oh, yeah. Do you guys want me to uh, end it and let you guys restart? Letty, you had something you wanted to tag on and say, right? And go over a few more things. Did you want to go over a few more things? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Let me end this really quick. I will, t I, okay. I will send a quick text as soon as it's done doing its madness, okay? All right, we will be right mm -hmm. for round two, okay, or three, technically. All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hopefully this will be one of the last times you have to watch a, you know, pseudo chunk of today's session. Next week, uh, this will never happen again. Let's just put it that way, so it'll just be one smooth session. But, um, Fiona just finished talking about all the renal stuff and she did a fantastic job on that. And I'm going to now throw the floor over to Letty and Letty is going to talk about everything she wants to fill us in on today. The floor is yours. Guys, so today I'm going to be discussing a little bit about diabetes and stuff. But first, um, I wanted to kind of give you guys like a little bit something of what I'm doing. So... In our first video, we discussed, um, you know, making one page notes for each of the diseases and stuff, yeah. because when it comes to exams, when it comes to your final, like, 
you know, if that is cumulative, all you have to do is get your one page notes and then all the information is going to be on there. So what I have, you know, that I'm going to be including in my one page notes. So everybody is different. Um, I'm going to be including the pathophysiology, its causes, the signs and symptoms, nursing assessments, types of nursing diagnosis. So the, I include the nursing diagnosis because when we go into the hospital, you know, we're assessing our patients and we have to decide, um, you know, what are we going to do our mini care plan on or what are we going to do, um, you know, our clinical worksheets on. So having examples of nursing diagnosis already in your notes can kind of give you an idea of what mini, like, what are you going to do for your mini care plan? Absolutely. I'm also going to include nursing interventions, and that's going to include patient teaching, because as nurses, we do a lot of patient teaching. I'm also going to be including lab values, types of medications, and the diagnostics. By diagnostics, I mean like x-rays or like an angiogram or like doing EKGs, MRIs, and stuff like that. All right. So yeah, I have the patho flashcards and I actually made these little doodles um, <laughs> from these flashcards. So that's just to kind of give me a better idea of what, you know, like what I'm looking at. I like to draw it out. That actually really helps me to kind of connect all the dots and stuff. So I'm gonna show you guys what I did for um, diabetes mellitus type one. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so what I have here is I wrote down the lab. So we have FBS, which is fasting blood sugar, or it could also be uh, fasting blood glucose, but I know it as FBS. And that's going to be a value of greater than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliters. And then we have OGTT, which is oral glucose uh, tolerance test. And that's going to be um, greater than or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter. Then we have hemoglobin A1C, which is going to be greater than or equal to 6.5%. And a random blood glucose test of greater than or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter. So the random blood glucose test is going to be like the finger stick. You know, you know, you get a lancet which is going to come in like a little tiny thing like this you you know you clean the finger like i think 10 times with a little cotton swab and then you let it dry completely and then what you're going to do is you're going to get on like a side of the finger you're not going to get it in the middle you're going to get it on the side like right here or right here like if you can't really tell about here or here and you're just going to click it and it's going to prick the patient's finger and then you're going to wipe away the first drop of blood and then you're going to get more blood and that's the blood you're going to use um, to put onto the little strip to read um, the blood glucose and the reason that we wipe away the first blood drop is because that has like a lot of how do I say I think if I remember correctly, it has like a lot of platelets and, you know, stuff like that. So we want to clean that away and get a good drop of blood. Yeah. So in the book, the OGTT is basically the two hour postprandial uh, test. So I just wanted to also clarify that. And then right here, I drew a pancreas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be like this. I, I am going to be uploading Weird Al's pancreas song at some point in time. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even <laughs> kidding. It's, it's going down, you guys. Oh my, I'm not going to sing it. Anyways, okay. um, real quick note, the, the, the stuff that you put up there, those are when the ranges are outside the range they're supposed to be, when you have signs of diabetes. Because fasting yeah. blood glucose should be below. 126. Yeah. Uh, HGBC, yeah, all that. The A1C should be below 6.5. And if it's between 6.5 and I think 7.0, it's like pre diabetes. And then after 7.0, if it's greater than 7.0, it's definitely diabetes. Um, so everything should be below that for those of you who are watching. Um, if you see anything in these ranges that are greater or equal to this, then you've definitely got a diabetic problem. 
which you probably already stated, but just to verify. Yes. Okay. And then right here, I'm gonna explain my little drawing. So uh, in the pancreas, we have what we call uh, beta cells or islet of Langerhans. Yes. And these beta cells are going to release insulin in response to glucose. So we have, and also uh, insulin is considered the key to getting glucose into cells. So these cells, let's say these cells are gonna have like these little locks. They're pretend it's like a house and you're gonna, you wanna get into your house, you wanna let your guests into your house, but you need a key. So insulin is your key and you're gonna unlock that door and you're gonna let all those guests into your house. And so that's basically <clears throat> what it does, you know, normally. And in, um, so right here, you know, we have increased blood glucose, which this is a makeshift, like, you know, blood vessel over here. We have our red blood cells here. We have glucose and we have high blood glucose. And that's going to be like, to the beta cells, hey, you know, we have high blood glucose, we need to release some insulin so we can get that glucose into our cells. And in diabetes melanus, you're gonna have what's called the three Ps. So try to remember that because this is for type one and type two. Okay. So we have polyphagia, polyuria, and polydipsia. So you're gonna have increased urination, increased thirst, and it, I think that one's increased hunger. And then you're gonna have persistent hyperglycemia. So what this means is that the pancreas is not making enough insulin to get the glucose into the cells. So if you don't have glucose in your cells, you know you're gonna be having hyperglycemia. Yeah. And then there, you're going to have fatigue and weight loss as well. And then, so basically what diabetes mellitus one is, um, it's caused either by injury to the pancreas or like, you know, your, uh, I guess you could say like the audio, autoimmune response kicked in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, autoimmune can do a lot of damage. Yeah, so like, I don't know how to explain it really good, but basically in the book, it was saying that mm. diabetes type one is mostly like uh, early onset and then type two we would be considered like later onset. So we see um, type two more in older adults and then like you don't really see it in kids and you know, young adults you see type one more in kids and young adults. So that's what it means by like early onset. And then here I kind of drew <laughs> these little it. pictures. So these are the beta cells, you know, from the pancreas. Our primary uh, DM1 cause would be through autoimmune. So basically your immune system starts attacking the beta cells and it's destroying them. So you're not going to be having a lot of insulin production to get the glucose into the cells. And then we have secondary cause. So basically through other um, forces or causes besides your own immune system. So like inflammation of the pancreas and you have cystic fibrosis. So it could be like a disease that might affect the pancreas cause damage to the pancreas and stuff like that. So I kind of drew it like this to kind of help me remember, okay, you know, like this is what happens. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, um, I only read a tiny, tiny bit. So f correct me if I'm wrong. I think diabetes uh, mellitus one is, it's like your pancreas has ceased to create any insulin whatsoever, right? And it gets to that point. And you can actually get it as an adult, which was weird, which I did not know until I read the book. And I was like, really? I thought it was just like an only a kid diagnosis. But I guess you can get it, like you said, in you know, later adulthood. And um, eventually, you will get to the point where you no longer can create anything whatsoever that's key to diabetes mellitus 1 or 
diabetes, yeah, whatever. And so you will be reliant fully on insulin at some point in time. With diabetes mellitus 2, you won't necessarily have to take insulin if you utilize dietary measures and things like that, potentially. You might have to be reliant on insulin depending on your situation, but there is a chance that it, you can actually alter your diet and lifestyle to particularly change that as well. But that's yeah. not an option for the first one, not, not for DM1. No, so DM1, yeah. you, you actually need medication for yes. this. DM2, yeah. um, if you're getting to the pre-diabetes stage, diet and exercise and you know, having a healthy lifestyle can actually get you back into the normal range. Yeah. You have, like if you're more leaning towards, you know, like not just pre-diabetes, but actually getting into DM type two, then you know, you're probably gonna need insulin. Yeah. So um but yeah so this is my little drawing that i did i love it <laughs> and uh let me see so i'm gonna share so you know me i love to make flashcards and you're so. good at it so <laughs> it's great it's like yay <laughs> thank you well that's that's how i learn i actually learn a lot by making my own flashcards and you know everybody has their own way of yes you know doing things and how they learn and this is how i learn it and i think it kind of like sticks more and i start thinking about the other stuff so yep. One thing I also wanted to point out that I remember, I can't remember who told me, but they said, you got to know the normal to know the abnormal. So if you know the normal process of how, you know, the body does things, when you start studying all the diseases and you know, stuff like that, you're going to be like remembering what normal is. And then you look at the abnormal and you say, oh, so this is what went wrong. Exactly, exactly. And yeah. that's very true. You have to know, absolutely know that. And, and it saves the day. So you won't, if you don't know what's, what it's supposed to do, you're not going to know what's going on, you know, which is key. Yeah. Which also ties into, uh, to bring up what Mikey said again about the chronic thing, um, where he said, know the chronic illnesses, know what is normal <laughs> the normal chronic part yeah and it's like what is abnormally normal for the chronic stuff so that when something is even more you know adverse abnormal it's really, yeah it's gonna really stick out and you're like okay that that got worse that's definitely a problem we need to deal with that so that's definitely something that to to remember as well it's just a different way of thinking you know than than well, at least then I would normally go at it, you know. When he said that, that really opened my brain as for how to study for that. So that was helpful. Yeah. So yeah. in the book, we have this uh, figure. Helpful. So basically, this is um, how basically the normal process of blood glucose level control. So, you know, it gives you like, uh, when you have high or low, you know, glucose in the body, which of the cells in the pancreas are activated, either beta or alpha. So for the beta, it's always going to be insulin. For the alpha, it's always going to be glucagon. Okay. And then, you know, it, it tells you, you know, in insulin, you're gonna have body cells take up more glucose and the liver takes up glucose and stores it as glycogen. Glucagon, uh, the liver breaks down glycogen and releases glucose to the blood. And then, you know, it's gonna tell you, okay, you know, it's gonna try and get to a set point, either rise or decline, and then it's gonna go back to homeostasis. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you for um, and I believe that's going to be like in the third page of chapter 44. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go over some of the things that I noticed in the chapters. Um, I went ahead and took notes on it. So it talks about how in diabetes mellitus, you're going to have high blood glucose 
insulin deficiency and insulin resistance. And then you can also like the other types of diabetes that there are. You have gestational diabetes, which is diabetes that uh, pregnant women get. Yes. Um, you know, they start to have an intolerance uh, during pregnancy. Now this one, it can either go away or stay after they have given birth. Okay. Uh, the situation depends, but the mother is at risk of developing type 2 diabetes uh, within 15 years after giving birth. Oh, it's that long? Yes. Holy cow. Yeah. Wow. So um, I, I remember, I think, one of my friends back when I started college, um, she had... I think she said she had gestational diabetes and she had to go like on this diet and everything. And mm. she wasn't eating a lot of the stuff that she was eating before. And they still wanted her to gain weight because, you know, every trimester you're supposed to gain a certain amount of weight. Right. So that was very difficult for her. She said, Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's crazy. Okay. So in type one, the epidemiology we have, um, it's commonly diagnosed before 30 years old. And then the, let's see, the risk increases if a family member already has type one diabetes yeah. or an associated autoimmune disorder. Mm. And then we have environmental triggers, which are viruses like mumps, rubella, and stuff like that, toxic chemicals, exposure to cow's milk, and bovine antibodies, which I thought was interesting. That and is interesting. cytotoxins. Yeah. That is And then, so I already kind of went over the path, though. And then clinical manifestations, like I said, the three Ps, fatigue, weight loss, and hyperglycemia. Mm. For management, we have medical management, which is a diagnosis. Um, they diagnose it using the hemoglobin A1C, the fasting blood glucose, the two-hour postprandial test, and the random blood glucose, which I talked about also the four labs for those. And then for treatment, um, as far as pharmacological interventions go, the number one treatment is going to be subcutaneous insulin. Yeah. Um, let's see. And then blood glucose management. So that one just kind of basically goes into like the size of the syringe using an insulin pen or using uh, continuous subcutaneous insulin pumps. So those are going to, I'm guessing those are the ones that are permanently placed into um into their abdomen yes yes i believe so i'm not exactly then, sure how placed, but i do know they're placed yes yeah and then the other option that i saw in there was twice a day finger sticks with twice a day uh insulin injections and this is for the people that are unable or unwilling to manage their blood glucose because normally um in the book, it was mentioning that, you know, you check your blood glucose, I believe, before you eat mm -hmm. and before you go to sleep, and then you administer the correct amount of insulin, because if I remember, there's three types of insulin. You have prandial, you have correctional, and basal. Okay. So basal, I'm guessing, is the one that you would give right off the bat. Correctional is to correct for the amount of oxygen. Um, I believe carbs that are consumed and then prandial of course with meals okay that's cool and then let's see oh so in self-monitoring of blood glucose it says that the uh, most common patient related error is getting in inadequate blood sample size so they don't get enough blood onto the little, um, what do you call that? The strip? 
the strip. <laughs> That's the only thing I can think of right now myself. <laughs> this is a more technical <laughs> name, but who cares? We all know what we're talking about. <laughs> Just make sure you put it in the right way. <laughs> yes. All right. And then some complications of type 1 diabetes. You're going to have diabetic ketoacidosis. Yeah. Um, and hypoglycemia, I believe. Yeah. And yeah. the other one was the Don and Don phenomenon and Samogi effect. So with diabetic ketoacidosis, we um we have to know the difference between that and I believe it's hyper osmolar. Osm osmolality. I can never say that word. Hyperosmolality. Is that what it yeah. is? Yeah. Okay. Something. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think I do. <laughs> HHS. <laughs> He ate for acronyms for once. <laughs> <laughs> right. So let me see if I can go down here. Yeah, it's all nicely organized. Look at that. <laughs> if I had so, so I have a little thing about the difference between those two. Um, it's also in the chapter. Okay. So basically with DKA, it's most often seen in type one. Um but it can occur in type two, especially with severe stress. So it doesn't mean just emotional stress, but stress on the body, you know. Oh, okay. For example, cool. being an infection. Um, it's rapid onset, and in order to, like, some of the lab values that you would see for DKA, basically you're going to have um, a blood glucose greater than 250, a pH of less than or equal to 7.3, a bicarb of less than 18. You're gonna be positive for ketonuria and ketonemia. So you're gonna have ketones in your urine and in your blood. And then your osmolality is gonna be greater than 300 and you're gonna have a positive anion gap. Okay, yeah, that's- um, I wrote it around here somewhere about what the anion gap was, but basically there was a formula and it was, in the book so you take uh, it's uh you take chloride and you take bicarb and then i think the third one was potassium but i don't remember but it's you remember what chapter problem. what chapter it was because i read that and i forgot it too but it's in the diabetes chapter remember what chapter the diabetes <laughs> oh 44 <laughs> For thank you. I'm like, somebody help me because I cannot remember. I read it, I saw it, I don't remember what it was either. And I was like, well, that's interesting. I need to. Let me get I had back. written down the formula. Yeah. Yep. I know. I, I looked at it and I went, I'm going to have to do some more research on that. Um, okay, I have it. Yeah, it's sodium. It? So anion gap equals sodium minus, and then parentheses, chloride plus bicarb. So you're going to add your chloride lab values with your bicarb values. You're going to add those two together, and then you're going to subtract that number from sodium. Okay. And that's going to give you your anion gap. And I believe, if I remember, it was something about like, it has to do with a number two. I think it was like plus two or minus two or something like that. Okay. Um, I'll have to look it up. I'll yeah, probably include it in the descriptions for you guys. Yes. Um, yes. Letty will be leaving comments <laughs> of brilliance. <laughs> these things that um, anything that she wants to add that we've missed somewhere along the way. So feel free to check the comments for more glorious details that, you know, you're not getting now. And then I'm just going to briefly go over what HHS, HHS is. <laughs> it occurs more commonly in older, uh, I can't even talk, older adults in response to stress or infection. It has a gradual onset. And then your blood sugar is going to be uh, greater than 600, pH of greater than 7.4, a bicarb greater than 15, you're going to be negative for ketones in the blood and urine, and you're going to have a negative anion gap, and your osmolality is going to be greater than 320. Oh, dang. 
So again, this is in the chapter as well. I believe it's towards the end of the chapter. Okay. And then Thank you so much. let's see. So the treatment for DKA, you're basically be doing a fluid replacement with isotonic fluids. And then you're gonna correct uh, electrolyte imbalances. You know, mostly it's going to be um, <sighs> hypokalemia. I almost forgot to <laughs> say that. <laughs> Seems like it's and always then, a potassium one, I swear. It's always <laughs> some sort of potassium thing. And then you're going to do um, insulin administration. And I believe that's going to be through an IV drip or an IV piggyback. Okay. Um, so one thing I would like to point out, so it mentions potassium because, um, let me see. Okay, so one of the safety alerts in the book is saying if your patient has, uh, let me see. If your patient has, um, hypokalemia. You're going to treat hypokalemia before you give insulin administration because after you give insulin, um, what like not only is glucose going to go into the cell, but the potassium is also going to go into the cell. That's so right. if you, if the patient has hypokalemia and you administer insulin before correcting that electrolyte imbalance, the patient is going to have even more hypokalemia. That's a so really that's good. going to lead to um, cardiac irregularities and other not so good symptoms. Yeah, so you want to correct that before you administer insulin. And uh, if I believe most of the time what they do is they will give the insulin with um, potassium supplements. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Uh, the other one that I talked about, the complications with hypoglycemia, this can be acute or life-threatening because um, it mentions that our central nervous system, like our neurons and stuff like that, they use glucose to, you know, like for energy and stuff. That's like their meal. This is what they eat. They eat glucose only. So if you don't have glucose, then you know, your nerves and stuff are not going to be able to function properly. That, that even goes for your brain. I think your brain ingests 20% of the glucose that you eat, believe it or not, which is just insane. Yeah. <laughs> so you need to eat if you want to learn. <laughs> <laughs> so for this one, you're going to have, um, of course, we know anything less than 65 is going to be hypoglycemia. Yeah. And then you're at risk when you have decreased nutritional intake increased metabolism of glucose and increased exercise. Yeah. And then for the management of hypoglycemia, so the first thing you're doing is you're gonna administer glucose, oral glucose. So this could be like any rapidly absorbed carbs like juice, soda, honey, jelly, bread, crackers, you know, anything like that. That's going to be the first thing that you do. Then you're going to measure with a finger step or blood glucose in 15 minutes. And if it's still low, you're gonna give them more carbs. You're, so basically you're gonna repeat giving carbs our glucose mm -hmm. and measuring their blood glucose 15 minutes after they ingest what they've just eaten until it gets corrected. And it's also important, I don't know if the book talks about this, but um, I have a lot of friends that are diabetic. It's important, you know, once you get, they, they also sell that stuff at the store. You can buy those little tablets, which are great. They, those little tablets you can pop in case of an emergency or candy you can suck uh, to make sure you get that glucose immediately. And then you want to stabilize yourself by ingesting a carbohydrate and a protein as well. I don't know if the book goes into that or not, but I know that I have had friends go into that. So it's like you bring that up and then you want to make sure that you level it out because if you just keep ingesting that sugar, that simple sugar, you're going to spike each time and go up and down and up and down and up and down. So if the book doesn't mention it, uh, it should be there at some point in time. Uh, it might come out in lecture because it's one of those things where you're going to want to make sure that you administer a protein with a carbohydrate, but not overdo it obviously because then we're going to have more problems on the diabetic end of things. 
did the book mention it at all? Because I haven't had a chance to get that far. I don't believe the book went into giving proteins with carbs, really? but it did mention giving carbs. Oh my gosh, they absolutely have to give protein with carbs. Yeah, it's, it's it, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, what? What's that not doing there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> On behalf of all my diabetic friends, eat a protein with a carb. <laughs> It'll stabilize everything for you. Proteins keep your blood sugar a lot more level for a lot longer, but they take a longer time to digest. But the carbs and a complex carb is what you're going to want to ingest, not just the simple carb. Because if you just keep eating those simple carbohydrates, it's going to spike you over and over again. But those complex carbs, they take longer to digest. It's going to keep you more stable. But then again, like you said, you're going to have to balance that with whatever you're ingesting and whatever insulin amount that you're injecting. So yay for that. <laughs> it's like a complete math equation all day long. <laughs> now, in the case that your patient cannot ingest carbs, you're going to be giving um, IV dextrose, like 25 to 50 um, milliliters of D50. Um, let's see. Also, if the patient has, if the patient can't swallow and there's no IV access, you're going to be giving one milligram of intramuscular glucagon. Okay. Um, so for the Dawn phenomenon and the Samogi effect, to determine if it's one or the other, basically, um, you're gonna be checking the blood glucose in the early morning, like around two or three in the morning, um, and then every night, so it's going to be checked every night. And then if the patient has a low blood glucose around that time, it's considered the Samogi effect. If they have a high blood glucose, it's considered the Dawn phenomenon. Oh, interesting. So yeah. the Dawn phenomenon is, let me see, basically it's a high fasting blood sugar which is, which means um, decreased insulin and increased glucose. Um, I forget, uh, but there's something I didn't write, but they mentioned it in the book. So basically it's like, um, oh my God, I really can't remember, but you know what? I'm gonna like leave it in the comments later. It's okay, it's no problem. <laughs> We're student nurses. We get to get away with this. <laughs> okay, so for the nursing interventions for type one, you're going to be checking their vital signs. You're going to check for like their blood pressure. They're going to have low BP, um, increased heart rate. They're going to have increased respirations. They're going to have too small or hyperventilation, and then they're going to have the fruity breath. So this is one thing. Uh, two of the things that stand out to me is going to be too smalls and the fruity breath. So. Um, I guess, you know, those are the two things that really stuck with me. I also learned that in my EMT class. Uh, they're also going to have hypovolemia. You're going to also assess their serum glucose. You're going to assess their potassium levels. You're going to check their INO because they're going to have increased urine output. And then you're also going to check their carb intake in meals. So you want to make sure they're not ingesting too little carbs, too many carbs, you know, yeah. when should you administer the insulin? Should you administer it before or after they eat? So if they're not eating a lot of carbs or they're not getting a lot of intake, you want to administer the insulin after they eat. If they have a regular diet, you know, everything's fine. You administer it before they eat. Okay. Um, so for type two, I'm just going to go over this super quick. Uh, the risk factors can either be genetic or lifestyle. And then in the book, it mentions modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable um, risk factors. And it also highlights on the metabolic syndrome. So modifiable, modifiable risk factors, you have your BMI, your physical activity, you have your HDLs, triglycerides, which can be modified through diet. And then the metabolic syndrome, uh, basically, the risk factors are resistance to action of insulin, hypertension, high cholesterol, low HDLs, and hypercoagulability. Um, the patients must have at least three of the following to be considered to have metabolic syndrome. So they must have either 
abdominal or central obesity, so meaning that most of the fat in their body is concentrated in their midsection. Yeah. You're gonna have um, high triglyceride levels, so greater than or equal to 150. You're gonna have low HDLs. Um, and then it's going to be less than or equal to 40 in men or less than 50 in women. Mm -hmm. They're gonna have hypertension, so anything yeah. greater than or equal to 130 over 85 and a fasting blood sugar of greater than 100. So non-modifiable risk factors include having a first degree relative with diabetes mellitus. So if someone in your family has it, there's a chance that you may have it or not have it, but could potentially get it if you, know, you don't take care of yourself. Yeah. And then you have uh, members that are high risk ethnic, population we have african americans latinos native americans asian americans pacific islanders women who have delivered babies uh, greater than or equal to nine pounds that were diagnosed with gestational diabetes uh, people with hypertension uh, women with pico so polycystic ovary syndrome mm -hmm. um, a high hemoglobin A1C, so greater than or equal to 5.7%, uh, history of cardiovascular disease, and then, um, let's see, I believe that is it for that. So basically the patho for this one, you're going to have insulin action resistance, which leads to increased insulin to drive glucose into cells. The beta cells fail um, fail to um, you know do their job and stuff. And then we have the clinical manifestations. So again, the three P's: fatigue, uh, and then you're also going to see poor wound healing. Yeah. There might be more susceptible to cardiovascular disease, as I mentioned earlier. They're going to have visual disturbances, renal insufficiency, and recurring infections. So by recurring infections, basically, <clears throat> since they have like high glucose in their body and bacteria love sugar and oh, yeah. glucose and everything. So it's going to be feeding off of that glucose and the, effect, the infection is going to keep coming back. So one of the examples that the book gave for that was yeast infections. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, the vagina is supposed to be normally acidic. So when a woman has um, a high blood glucose, they could be more susceptible to yeast infections because <clears throat> the vagina is not like, uh, it's not acidic enough, basically. Yeah. And then we have... So for this one, the medical management or diagnosis for this is going to be the same four things as for type 1, except you're also going to be looking for insulin antibodies. So for type 2, you're, gonna, you're not going to have insulin antibodies. And for type 1, you are. So that's the difference between that. <clears throat> and then, so... For type two, you're gonna have oral meds, which are going to increase insulin production, decrease insulin resistance, decrease carb absorption, and decrease blood glucose. And the most common treatment given for patients is basically metformin, diet, and exercise. Yeah. Um, one of the things it does highlight in the book for self-management is that the patient must be committed to their treatment because if they're not committed to their treatment, their condition is only going to get worse. Yeah, that is that is very true. Very true. So patient education is very key when it comes to yeah. diabetes. They actually, um, in the book, it mentions that when a, a patient is diagnosed with diabetes, they're actually referred to a program where they are taught everything about diabetes, like how to management, foods to eat, what to oh, do when you have hypo or hyperglycemia, like when to check your blood glucose, um, 
you know, your diet, exercise, types of exercises that you should be doing, and, you know, how to interpret the results of your blood glucose, what to do, what not to do, and everything. That's really awesome. That's good, because to have something specific like that, just targeted for for that, because that's a very big genre of a need. You know, it's a lot to know and a lot you can do. Yeah. That's it. That's a lot of teaching. That's good. Mm -hmm. So one of the complications for type 2 is going to be HHS. So hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. (laughs) And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, there you're going to have the land values for blood glucose, osmolality, osmolality. Uh, pH, bicarb, ketones, and stuff like that. And then the treatment for HHS is going to be um, IV fluids for dehydration. So you're going to be giving um, 0.9% normal saline for dehydration. Um, And then you're going to have, uh, you're going to treat their altered mental status. Uh, you're also going to be doing airway management, and you're going to give them IV insulin. And again, it's not the whole 1,000 milliliter bags of IVs. You're going to have IV piggy bags. It's going to be small. <laughs> so <laughs> no overload. I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> Let's see. So in type 2, it says that it affects your vascular system. So um, it damages the large arteries that supply uh, blood to the heart and the brain. Um, These patients are actually two to four more times likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. Yeah. And then for, uh, it also damages the small blood vessels like in the eyes, their eyes are going to be affected. They're going to be having like retinal hypoxia, blindness. They're going to have periodontal disease. They're going to have renal failure. Mm-hmm. And they're going to have a lower extremity peripheral artery disease mm-hmm. um, and non traumatic amputations. I've heard, I'm sure you, a lot of you have heard that, you know, diabetics getting like your limbs amputated and stuff. Yeah. Mm, let's see. What else? So they're gonna have neurological effects. They're gonna have diabetic peripheral neuropathy. So um, they're gonna have like numbness, tingling, or pain in their feet and hands. Yeah. They're gonna have the protective, uh, loss of protective sensation. So like, let's say, you know, they're getting burned or something. They may not feel it as much. So, you know, if I'm cooking, for example, and my hand touches the pan, I might not notice that my hand touched the pan until way after. And it could cause even more damage because initially our reaction is when we touch something hot, it's like, oh, you know, we pull back. Yeah. So in someone that, you know, like has, you know, diabetes, they might not feel it right away. They might not pull back right away. Yeah, it's so a good they're gonna point. have that you know loss of sensation there. So that's what it means by loss of protective sensation. Yeah. Another thing that it mentions is patients having properly fitted shoes. So a lot of type two is going to be with foot care. So you know you want to make sure that your shoes are properly fitted. They're not too wet. Um, you want to make sure there's like no like nothing in the shoe that can cause irritation um yeah stuff like that and careful with the way that you you know i think you're supposed to file your toenails versus you know cut them you're not supposed to cut like the ingrown part of the toenail so you can clip the toenail straight but you can't start to go in and you know do the ingrowns yeah so as nurses we are all, we're only supposed to cut the nail, you know, straight if we do cut their nails. We're not supposed to do anything about their ingrowns or anything other than that. If the condition looks pretty bad, they're supposed to be referred to a podiatrist to get special treatment for their toenails. 
Absolutely. Yeah, because feet, that's one of the ones where it just gets messed up a lot is the feet big time. And then they have to get a lot of referrals for podiatry, like you said. So it's just crazy. Yeah. And then they're also going to be having autonomic neuropathy. So you're going to be seeing like um, what's called diabetic gastroparesis. And that's basically delayed or erratic emptying of the stomach contents. Mm. Uh, they can have bloating. They're going to have nausea, vomiting. Uh, their blood sugar can drop or spike. And this is because <clears throat> um, if they have delayed, uh, like, emptying of the stomach, nothing is really going to be going into their small intestines or their large intestines as it should be. Okay. You know, the way it normally would. So they could have a drop or a spike in their blood glucose. Yeah. And then you're also going to be seeing erectile dysfunction, orthostatic hypertension, and urinary problems. So they could have like difficulty uh, starting urination. They could have inability to fully empty bladder, UTIs, again, you know, because of the glucose, um, more prone to infections. So for nursing management, uh, for... I mean, sorry, nursing interventions. You're going to assess their bio size. They have low blood pressure, high um, heart rate. They're going to have uh, uh, hypovolemia. They could have a high temperature due to infection. Um, they're going to have. You're going to check their glucose. You're also going to be checking um, capillary refill, and you want to make sure that's normal. So it's going to be three. If it's greater than three or more seconds, they're going to be having delayed capillary refill. Yeah. And then you're going to check their skin. So this is going to be another like major thing to look out for. You're going to uh, check for breaks in the skin, erythema, trauma, pallor, uh, dependent rubor, changes in foot size and shape, nail deformities, extensive callus, skin breakdown, and then any wounds that may have gone unnoticed again because of the decreased, um, <sighs> loss of protective sensation. You're gonna also check their INO, they're gonna have increased urine output. You're gonna check their white blood cells in case they have infection. You're also going to check their blood and creatinine. So for this one, if both their bun and their creatinine are high, this is going to be indicative of decreased renal function. Yeah. And then another thing that I learned from simple nursing was if your bun is high and your creatinine is low, you're going to have dehydration. That's indicative of dehydration. So just yes. a little thing to throw out there. That's awesome. You're it's also going to check man. for... Everything's, oh, about sorry, to Everything's about to croak. I'm warning you now. <laughs> oh really? There's a time yeah. limit. Uh, my computer's now officially about to croak too, so I'm like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'm away from a power source, so um, I haven't had the time limit pop up. I'm kind of surprised it didn't because I think by now it would have. But my battery's about to die, so we uh oh. Go plug in your battery. <laughs> I I can't move it from here. I can't. I literally oh my god. Problem, which it, I'm being okay. How much time do I have? Well, I'm at 8%, so I'm going to have to cut out soon because it's video footage, so. Okay, so yeah. should I stop, continue? How much do you think you can say, sorry, how much more do you have to say? I'm just going to mention dietary guidelines, and that's basically it. Yeah, that should be, yeah, as long as we can, some, I'll let you know, because I don't want to lose what we have either, because if my computer dies, we're in trouble. Okay. I muted it to see if I could make it, yeah, it's a pain in the butt. Anyways. Go ahead. All right. And then you're also going to check their microalbuminuria. <laughs> um, so basically, if they have this, they're going to have microvascular damage to the kidneys from hypertension and or hyperglycemia. You're also going to check their carb intake at meals. So you, you want to make sure they're getting like adequate carb intake and everything um, and not too many carbs. Yeah. So for dietary guidelines, for carbs, it should be 45 to 60 grams per meal, less than 20 grams for snacks. And then if the patient is consuming sugar, you want to like substitute the amount of carbs you're supposed to have in a day for sugar. 
So okay. let's say in a day they're having 60 grams of carbs or per meal, I'm sorry. And then you have sugar. So if you want to add like, let's say five grams of sugar, they're gonna be having five grams of sugar and 55 grams of carbs. So you wanna keep like those numbers together. So like when you look at the nutritional labors, labels, sorry, you're gonna look at total carbs, not just sugars. Their protein daily intake should be 15 to 20 percent. And then, if they have diabetic neuropathy, they should see a dietitian to get individualized, um, like meal plans and stuff. And then, fiber intake is going to be 25 to 50 grams per day. Their dietary fat intake is going to be less than 30 percent of daily intake, so total fats. They're going to have less than seven percent of saturated fats. Um, and then you want to eliminate trans fats and so you want to like completely leave those out. If the patient is going to be consuming alcohol, for females, it should be less than or equal to one drink. For males, it can be less than or equal to two drinks, not fair, a day. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> and then one drink classifies as a 12 ounce beer or a five ounce wine or a 1.5 ounce of 80 proof spirits. Oh, wow. And alcohol should be consumed with food. And that's basically it. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much, Letty. You did a fantastic job. <laughs> Appreciate it. I'm, I'm sorry everything's croaking out. For, I can't believe it because you would think it'd be the time limit this time. It's like it didn't do it to us this time, which is weird. I know we've been at it for a while. But <laughs> now my computer is dying. I'm like, well, we can't win tonight. I'm going to see if I can try to merge all these videos together. I'm going to go see if I can try to do that really quick. Um, but thank you so much. That was really helpful and really detailed. And, and I greatly appreciate all of your time. Thank you so much. So is there, uh, are we ready to end it on this end? Tell everybody um, to go watch the video. Go watch the video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, subscribe, leave comments, ask questions about stuff you might want us to like do videos on. I mean, we're just nursing students, but you know what? We can do research too. So go ahead and leave some comments or maybe sure. you have suggestions on how to do stuff. I don't know whatever you want to comment on. Something you want to add that, that works for you that might work for somebody else, feel free to leave a comment below. Yeah. Below. No. <laughs> Thank you so much, Letty. Thank you for everything. And you have a wonderful night. All right. You too. Have a good night. You too. And bye, everybody out there. All right, we'll bye. <laughs> bye.